My name is Victoria Robinson and I'm fortunate enough to direct the American Culture Center on campus which hosts the graduation requirement for all of our Berkeley undergraduates. It's a campus graduation requirement built around race and it's been here on campus for 25 years coming out of the movement, the anti-apartheid movement and then moving to a decolonial struggle on the campus. So that's just a little part history. But the AC Center is hosting a book series to really kind of provoke and animate the experience of being um, within American cultures on the campus, taking these courses, trying to bring people together, foster some collectivity, just create relationships, create some sharing. So that's, that's kind of the context of why we're here today. And it's really amazing that we get to welcome Chris and Rachel uh, to these events today. My colleague Sean Burns from the Blum Center is going to introduce Chris, but I just want to quickly introduce introduce Rachel. Rachel and I, um, we've known each other about three years. Yeah, and we were introduced through a student who was a student in one of my classes here called Ari. And Ari had been taking a class with me on social movement racial politics. And he basically came up to me at the end of the semester and said, you know what, I think there's some stuff missing here. Have you heard about critical resistance? <laughs> and it was one of those real moments that sticks with me and will always stick with me of the inversion of what a student-teacher relationship means. And I'm both really grateful for that, but also grateful for the incredible introduction that he made to me with critical resistance and Rachel. Um, Rachel's work continues to really provoke my own thinking around how abolition can enter institutions like UC Berkeley. What does a visionary politics look like? What does it, does it hold us accountable to? Who does it include? What direction does it move a, maneuver through? Um, and what are some of the pitfalls that we may need to watch out for? We were just sharing as we came together that um, here at the university when we try to kind of lift an effort, when we try to do political organizing, the words of Rachel and Critical Resistance really kind of resonate with how we need to be thoughtful of um, what comprom compromises may we be willing to make, are we being asked to make, and how do we ensure that we're not building structures that ultimately will have to collapse in the near or long future. Rachel also talks about the idea of the horizon of possibilities, of really focusing on that horizon of um, holding ourselves accountable to both dream and action at the same time. And these are all incredibly important things in um, a set of work that is often hard, has a fight attached to it, is embedded in struggles. And I can't thank Rachel enough for being here to participate in the discussion with Chris today, and all of you for participating with us. So thank you, Rachel. And Sean, do you want to move to your yeah. probably far more lucid introduction? <laughs> I never uh, aim for lucidity. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this book here in my hands is a real contemporary treasure, and it's a great uh, honor to be here today to uh, have both um, the author, Chris Dixon, who I'll say a word about, but also somebody who speaks lucidly within the text. Rachel Horzing. Um, so, uh, my name is Sean Burns, and as Victoria said, I uh, work here at Cal and teach on social movement history and social movement culture and politics. Um, I've benefited greatly from a number of you in the room, not just Chris Dixon, but also some of the mentors that Chris and I share, Barbara Epstein notably long-time professor from UC Santa Cruz who mentored us, dear friends like Eddie Ewan, many new friends here. Um, in the late 20th century and the early part of this century, uh, my assessment is that in the spaces where I think the most cogent uh, discussion and analysis of uh, the landscape of progressive and radical social movements. Where that was happening, Chris Dixon was near. Um, be it left turn that for a good decade, so importantly, uh, reflected and 
and strategize on movement building in the wake of Seattle, be it up in the ante now at 16 or 17 editions in, uh, such an important uh, Canadian-based journal. Chris has been connected to both of those. Chris's piece in 2005 on movement uh, relevant theory um, is, was a pivotal intervention um, in a number of disciplines. From my perspective, I, I, I hold very dearly the whole notion that in one sense is a pillar for this text, that movements produce vital knowledge and, um, and that the academy as we stand here uh, can learn greatly from those movement spaces. Well, um, Chris's piece in 2005 has basically been referred to in every subsequent um, piece of writing that uh, honors that sort of framework, honors that kind of epistemology. Um, and uh, in short, the kinds of analysis um, and vision that Chris brings is grows out of decades of, of being rooted in community struggles and uh, the solidarity work he's done and that he continues with. That is the, the root of, of his insights and uh, so they are fundamentally communal and, and, and fundamentally relational and uh, I, we're really excited to hear about this work. I think it's a proud moment for UC Press to put out a text like this. And um, the book is available in the back. I really recommend getting a copy. The, the footnotes alone uh, <laughs> are phenomenal. <laughs> the resources, the number of interviews and people you'll learn about. So I um, want to also mention that Chris will be speaking later tonight. If you feel like others need to hear from Chris, particularly undergraduates, he's doing a workshop tonight at 6 o'clock in combination with the Public Service Center on maintaining visionary politics. Rachel will be there as well. Um, this weekend, I know many of you are probably aware of the Howard Zinn Book Fair happening in San Francisco. Phenomenal collection of uh, writers, activists, uh, scholars. Chris will be among them. Barbara, others here too. So. Let's give a warm welcome to Chris Dixon from Ottawa. Thanks. Um, it's really wonderful to be here with all of you. Uh, I've really been looking forward to this this time at Berkeley. This like today's a, a two event day at, at Berkeley. I could spend the entire day on this campus. Um, and I want to start by thanking Victoria and where did Doug go? There it is. And Victoria and Doug uh, and Sean for really facilitating this this whole event and setting it up and doing the logistics and actually being really intentional about setting this space. Uh, really appreciate that. And um, the other thing I want to do, as is my practice at the beginning of an event, is to acknowledge that we are on traditional indigenous territory, and in this case, of the Ohlone people. Uh, and I do this not as a formality, not as a piece of rhetoric, but actually as a small effort to push back against uh, colonialism and ongoing erasure of memory. Uh, and also to point to the ongoing resistance and resilience of indigenous peoples across this continent. Um, it's been a fascinating education for me to actually, on this speaking tour, figure out who are the traditional people of every single place that I go to. In a Canadian context, this is a regular practice. We do in the US, it's much less common. So I'm hoping that some of that may come out also in what I'm going to say, and perhaps in our discussion together, too. So uh, I am from Anchorage, Alaska, on traditional Medina territory, originally. And I currently live in Ottawa, Ontario, and it's the national capital of Canada on traditional Algonquin territory. For many years, I lived on the US West Coast in Washington State, Oregon, and here in California, where I went to graduate school in Santa Cruz. I was involved in a variety of social justice struggles, and I also went to graduate school. Um, and uh, in, for the last seven years, I've been in the Canadian context. And so I have a perspective that is based on living on both sides of the border and being involved in organizing work on both sides of the border. 
I'm a deprofessionalized academic. What that means is that I went to graduate school to get a PhD with no intention of ever becoming a professor, but rather to try and use the space of universities to further the movements that I care about. So this work that I'm doing here is part of my ongoing commitment to deprofessionalization. I'm not a professor and you don't have to call me doctor. Uh, and I am a collective member of the Institute for Anarchist Studies, which is an organization that basically gives out grants to fund people who write about radical ideas and radical history. So if you're interested in that, and particularly if you're not a professor, talk to me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is this book, uh, which is the result of a research project that I worked on for about eight years. that involved me traveling across the US and Canadian context interviewing experienced activists and organizers, and asking questions about what are we learning? What kinds of challenges are we coming up against? What kind of unanswered questions are we grappling with as we're doing work in a whole variety of situations? And the book was my attempt to try and pull together some of the really kind of amazing wisdom that came out of these interviews, and also an attempt to kind of broadly characterize some of the shared politics that I saw coming together across a variety of kind of radical movement contexts. And um, on that note, one thing I want to say is that you will witness uh, a magic trick today. And this is the magic trick. It will seem as if I'm talking and that there are ideas coming just out of my head. Um, and that's partly because we live in a culture that focuses on individuals and looks to individuals to be very smart and clever. And the fact of the matter is, I am not a brilliant person, but I'm really happy to be connected to many brilliant movements. And so what I'm going to do is try and convey some of that brilliance through what I talk about. So when I'm talking, you need to understand that it's not just me. It's dozens, if not hundreds, of people who bring experiences and insights that I'm trying to get across here. Is that Make sense? That's the magic trick. <laughs> and then the last thing is, as is my practice, whenever I speak publicly, I like to dedicate what I'm going to say to a particular organization that I've learned a great deal from and that has really influenced my thinking. And today, I would like to dedicate this talk to Solidarity Across Borders in Montreal, which has been doing work now for more than 10 years, uh, radical migrant justice organizing and fighting back against immigration regimes in the Canadian state and is closely connected to the known as a legal network, which I'll talk more about in a little bit. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is talk about a political tendency that I think is increasingly influential uh, across this continent and that we can see on the edges of a variety of movements, a variety of, kind of radical edges of movements. I think we can see it, we saw some of it within the Occupy movement, I think we can see some of it within, I don't know more, the last couple of years of upsurge of indigenous struggles, particularly in the Canadian context. I think we can see it in the movement against the prison industrial complex, and I think we can see it within the climate justice movement, among other contemporary movements. For shorthand, I'm going to talk about this political tendency as the anti-authoritarian current. And that is just a shorthand, but it's the kind of abbreviation that I've decided to use. And just so that we're on the same page from the get-go, I will go deeper into this, but in terms of a definition, I think part of what distinguishes the anti-authoritarian current is this combined commitment to two things. One is a politics opposing a whole set of interlocking systems and institutions, including a critical stance toward the state. And the second one is a commitment to grassroots organizing among people who don't self-identify as activists necessarily. So a commitment to actually trying to build movements that extend beyond uh, activist scenes. And there, over the last couple of decades, there are a lot of people coming out of these kinds of politics who've been building organizations, networks, campaigns of various kinds. I think we did see many examples, including the known as a legal network in Canada that I mentioned and that I'll go more into. I think we can see examples in some national level organizations here in the U.S., including critical resistance, and also insight women of color against violence. Uh, and I think we can also see some of this within the Rising Tide North America network, which brings together more than 60 local climate justice groups 
And I think we can see this around some radical publications, like Makeshift Magazine, an important feminist publication out of Los Angeles, and also up in the ante in the Canadian context. Those are just a few examples. The basic point is that I think that there are a lot of people with this kind of broad commitment who are bringing that into a whole variety of activist and organizing work, whether it's related to prisons, poverty, racial justice, militarism, feminist institution building, radical queer networks, lots of things, lots of things. So what I'm gonna to do today is try and give you a sense of this kind of emerging radical politics. Uh, and, well, I'll be straightforward about it. I'm really a linear thinker, so I'd like to tell you what I'm gonna do. And so these are the three things. I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about three important historical strands that I think have led into this contemporary politics. I'm gonna talk about four defining characteristics of what this politics is. And then I'm gonna to turn to some lessons that I think come out of some of the work that people have been doing and it resonated very broadly across people that I spoke with. Does that make sense as a framework? And the idea is that I'm gonna talk for basically somewhere between 35, 40 minutes and then Rachel is gonna have a whole set of brilliant comments that follow. <laughs> 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 um, based on whatever themes that she wants to take up or more kinds of questions that she wants to go into, and then we're gonna open it up for a discussion. So that's, the, that's kind of the plan for our time together. Okay, so to start out, I was trained as a social movement historian, actually by that woman, Barbara Epstein. Uh, and the reason, and what happened is, being trained as a social movement historian means that I always approach any political phenomenon with one question, which is, where did it come from? Right? What are the origins of this? And so that's actually where I'm gonna start what I'm gonna do here in talking about the anti-authoritarian current as a political tendency. Where did it come from? And I think there are actually very long histories of where this emerges from. And for me, these actually go back to early fights against the colonization of the Americas and also have deep roots in the original abolitionist movement that, that fought slavery on this continent. And I think it also has important roots in early socialist politics. But I'm gonna fast forward a little bit and talk more about kind of the newer, the newer history, the more recent history here. And I think that particularly over the last few decades, there's been this convergence of various kinds of kind of radical and anti-authoritarian politics with broader based movements. And that together, these convergences are creating something, creating the basis for something. And so I want to talk about three political strands that I think have been especially important in this kind of movement convergence over the last few decades. And each of these strands in important ways has their origins in the 1970s. So the first one is women of color feminism. How many people have heard the term women of color feminism before? Okay. That makes things a little easier. And to the extent that you've heard about women of color feminism, that's actually based on the intense struggles of radical women of color in the academy to build space to talk about and develop those politics. Um, and when, when I'm talking about this political strand, which, by the way, is sometimes known also as anti-racist feminism, especially in the Canadian context, a lot of times people call it anti-racist feminism. Um, this is a political strand that has a very long history to it, but really bloomed in relation to the liberation movements of the 1960s. And I would argue really came into its own in the 70s and 80s. And there's lots of different routes that this political strand took in the color feminism. But I think, to generalize, we could say that one important starting place for this was radical women of color, often lesbians, looking around at existing social movements in the 1970s and saying, none of these movements fully account for the ways in which we simultaneously are experiencing various forms of oppression and exploitation. And these folks came together in collectives, in conferences, through publications, social scenes, all kinds of things, and start to develop a shared politics that is, is in many ways what we now understand as women of color feminism. And if you've ever taken a gender studies class, you've probably read 
what I think is one of the most important early articulations of these politics, which is the Kambahi River Collective Statement, written in 1977 by a black feminist collective in Boston. And I know it's something that many people have read, but I actually find myself keep re returning to this document because I think it's so rich. And so I want to read to you just one sentence out of it. So in 77, this collective wrote, we are actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression, and sees our particular task the development of integrated analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. So this was a, an amazing thing to say in 1977. And they were calling for what they called an integrated analysis of oppression, right? And part of what that was pointing to was to suggest that the ways in which systems of power work in the society shape not only the experience of women of color, but everybody, right? We're all situated within these dominant systems. And this also, this kind of integrated analysis called for a certain kind of revolutionary politics that prioritized a multi-layered fight against oppression, right? Not one thing at a time, but actually trying to take on stuff simultaneously. These are major interventions that I don't think we should take for granted. And there's a whole history to tell about what has happened in this political strand in the last three decades. I think it's developed in very interesting ways. And of course, within academic contexts, many people now use the word intersectionality. Um, although I think it's really important to understand that that word is actually rooted in grassroots organizing and political development in a much earlier period that then got taken up and developed in some other ways in academic contexts. One of the most important organizations, I think, for developing some of these ideas in the last little while is Insight Women of Color Against Violence, which, starting in 2000, has really done quite a lot, I think, to spread and deepen some of these politics. It's not to say that there haven't been other important political formations, too, but I like to highlight Insight, partly because it's, it's a national organization. We don't have too many national organizations like this right now. Um, so, and I think the kind of radical women of color feminism that Insight and others have been developing has been pushing this kind of integrated analysis with also a very deep understanding and opposition to capitalism and also a very critical stance towards the state, particularly state violence toward women of color. I think those are important political contributions. The other thing I want to say about this strand is that folks involved in these politics have been trying to put them into practice in a whole variety of ways. So one example of this is developing community-based organizing methods that are very specific to constituencies, like I'm thinking in particular of the experience of the organization Sista to Sista that existed in Brooklyn for a number of years, and was doing organizing work specifically with young working class women of color, and was trying to organize around both interpersonal violence, but also police violence that was happening in that community, and kind of build on that intersection of work. And they were using community organizing methods that I think are really, really useful, like storytelling as a way to actually build leadership and build trust in groups. Um, and also other kinds of collective leadership development that wasn't about lifting up particular individuals, but actually about developing the skill set of entire sets of people. The other thing I should say about Insight in particular is that they have developed this term, the nonprofit industrial complex. Have people heard this term before, nonprofit industrial complex? Okay, so what they're talking about, and this came out of a whole set of work that kind of came together in particular at a conference called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, uh, is a way of thinking about the circuit of state funding, private philanthropic funding, and nonprofit organizations, and how the funding circuit itself often shapes and constrains what's possible to do within movements. And that, I think, is a very important contribution, and it makes sense to me that this term has become very influential as a way for thinking. Okay, so the second strand I want to talk about is prison abolitionism. Is this a term that people have heard before? Okay. So, This particular political strand has a very long history as well, but I think it significantly emanates from the long black freedom struggle in this country that really from the get-go has fought against 
institutions of confinement, starting, I would argue, with the slave ship. And all the way up to the present, thinking about the array of institutions of confinement that we're facing today. So that said, I think it was the liberation movements of the 60s and 70s that were really crucible, that shaped these politics into what they are right now in many ways. And one important thing to say about this period, especially the 1970s, is this is a time where there's widespread organizing happening inside of prisons. Amazing organizing happening inside of prisons. It's related to people getting imprisoned as their, through their participation in movements, and then being inside, also people becoming politicized while they're inside, and all kinds of organizing and connection building going across those walls. And this crystallized into various kinds of organizing initiatives and also major confrontations, right? Like, so probably the most famous one in the United States is the 1971 Attica Uprising in upstate New York. In the Canadian context, there was a hunger strike at Middle Haven, a maximum security institution in southern Ontario in 1976. It spread across the country through multiple prisons and had a lot of outside support, too. Those are just a couple of examples, but this was a period where there was a lot of ferment happening in and around prisons. And I think it was out of this ferment in many ways that an abolitionist politics started to develop. And this was a politics that was about trying to do away with all institutions of confinement. That's what that was about. Now, fast forward, and as you can tell, I'm playing fast and loose with some of this history because our time <laughs> together is short. But fast forward to the early 1990s, right? Think for a moment about the early part of the 1990s, right? After a whole decade of Reaganism, a massive level of incarceration, historically unprecedented level of incarceration going on, driven in many ways by the drug war, but other things too, and disproportionately targeting communities of color in this country, right? So mass incarceration, all these institutions happening. People are trying to figure out how to understand this, how to talk about it. And that's when the term prison industrial complex comes into circulation. Mike Davis initially writes something and mentions this idea of prison industrial complex. But it becomes something that many people are using to try and make sense of this reality that's emerging. And when they say prison industrial complex, people are talking about the interlocking set of institutions and social relations based on surveillance, policing, and punishment, right? Not just prisons, not just cops, but actually a whole kind of set of things that are connected together. And so by the late 1990s, increasingly the radical edge of this movement against the prison industrial complex is coming together. And critical resistance plays a really important role in sort of convoking this, right? And bringing this edge together, first through conferences and then as an organization that is putting forward a prison industrial complex abolitionist politics. And critical resistance and other PIC abolitionists have really developed a kind of politics that is fundamentally challenging the legitimacy of the state to police and punish people. And I think importantly, it's also opened into a kind of critical analysis for understanding how the prison industrial complex is connected to how race, gender, class, sexuality, citizenship, ability, how all these things are actually connected. And in fact, that the PIC is in many ways about perpetuating and strengthening those kinds of social hierarchies and systems. Those, I think, are, are important contributions. And I should say, with this kind of abolitionism, people are also really good trying to figure out how to put these politics into practice. And I think there's a lot of examples to give, but I'll just mention two that have really struck me. One is a strategic framework that's based not on trying to reform institutions of incarceration, but do away with them altogether. And this has all kinds of practical implications, including significantly community-based organizing against prison construction, where a lot of people have put lots of efforts. But there's lots of other ways this is manifested in practice as well. The second example I just want to mention briefly is that Abolitionists, often in collaboration with radical women of color feminists, have also been exploring uh, how to develop non-state alternatives for dealing with violence, harm, and conflict as they happen in communities. And I think uh, one interesting experiment was the harm-free zone experiment in New York. But the harm-free zone folks actually 
try to write some stuff down and figure some stuff out, and the documents were still really useful. And basically what they were talking about was, in heavily policed communities of color, what kinds of social infrastructure can we build so that people can actually figure out what to do in the face of violence, harm, and conflict without calling 911? Because when you call 911, things usually get worse. Somebody often goes to jail, and sometimes somebody gets killed. So I don't want to make paint too rosy of a picture and say that like, the harm-free zone people figure this all out or anything like that, but uh, I think these are valuable, very valuable experiments that people have been working on. Okay, so the last strand that I want to talk about is anarchism. Um, is this also a term that people are familiar with? In the anarchist political tradition? Long history here, too. Historically, anarchist politics is, was, or was originally rooted in working class anti-capitalist movements of the late 19th century that were opposing capitalism, landlordism, and the state. Also, this politics was putting forward an affirmative vision of a new society based on social equality, self-management, solidarity, and mutual aid, all this good stuff. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the history of classical anarchism. Um, instead, I want to move into the mid-20th century and say that anarchist politics really underwent a major transformation related to the movements of the 60s and also the counterculture. And then starting in the 70s, there was a chain of movement experiences that I think really shaped anarchism into what it is as we understand it today. And I just want to briefly mention four links in this chain of movement experiences. I won't go in depth on them, but I think they're worth just mentioning. One is the nonviolent direct action sometimes called the anti-nuke movement of the 70s and 80s, which in involved people engaging in large-scale civil disobedience actions to try and fight nuclear power and nuclear weapons. The second is direct action AIDS activism, especially of the 1980s, but going on into the 1990s, and still exists today, often associated with the organization ACT UP in the US, and in Canada, the organization AIDS Action Now. So these were people who were using militant direct action tactics to try and push back against governments that were refusing to even utter the word AIDS, much less allow for experimentation and allocating resources for helping people. The third link in the chain is forced defense activism in the 1990s that was significant, particularly in the Northwest of the US. Uh, and this is often associated with Earth First. I think maybe Doug just made it. Um, it's okay, my PowerPoint is really rudimentary. It's, uh, it's meant to just sort of set some basic frames. Uh, and in the Northwest, people were basically creating all kinds of new forms of blockades and tree sits, various ways to try and protect the last of the old growth forests. And the last link in this chain that I want to mention is the global justice movement, sometimes called the anti-globalization movement, usually associated with a series of summit protests in the late 1990s and early 2000s, probably most famously the shutdown of the World Trade Organization Ministerial in Seattle in 1999. So this chain of movement experience has basically pulled together a package of activist practices and politics that I think is still really at the core of what anarchism looks like right now, at least at its best. And this package, I'll mention three things that were involved in it. Confrontational, often large scale, direct action and civil disobedience, various kinds of uh, directly democratic coordination and decision making, often working through smaller groups like affinity groups, which are groups of like five to 15 people in federation with other groups. And the last is a focus on trying to develop new ways of relating with one another and building new kinds of organizations and institutions. So this includes collective practices of care, trying to create housing co-ops, food co-ops, um, trying to relate with how power works within activist groups and doing things like anti-oppression trainings, all that kind of stuff. In the early 2000s, the global justice movement was starting to go down. This was related to the events of September 11, 2001, and also internal contradictions within that movement itself. But there were a bunch of people who'd been politicized through this chain of movement experiences who were like, what are we going to do? We've got all the skills and knowledge. What are we going to do with it? And they, many people turn toward community-based organizing of various kinds. Sometimes this was called a turn toward the local. And I think some of these efforts were quite sophisticated. 
And one example that has really stood out for me in this is the No One Is Illegal Network in Canada. Have people heard of No One Is Illegal before? Okay, not so much. I, didn't ex I don't expect people in the States so much about No One. So, in most major Canadian cities, there are No One Is Illegal collectives. And what they do is they fight deportations of individuals and families. And they try to fight deportations in ways that are deeply connected and embedded within broader migrant communities, trying to actually help migrant communities engage in self-defense against immigration authorities, and then win in these fights. Interestingly, known as legal collectives also build relationships with indigenous communities doing land defense struggles, often outside of cities. And they try to build kind of lateral relationships between urban, mostly urban migrant communities and mostly rural indigenous communities within a kind of shared understanding of colonialism and capitalism and how this creates shared conditions that people experience in different ways. So no one is illegal came out in many ways of the global justice movement. These were anarchists, primarily, who'd been involved in the summit protest cycle, who then turned, after the events of September 11, 2001, toward community-based fights in a moment of resurgent racism when borders were becoming very, very hard and relevant again. So there's, that's just one example. There's other examples out there that are worth talking about. And the last thing I want to say about anarchism before I move on is just that anarchist ideas and these practices I've talked about, of course, had an important role within the Occupy movement. And I think that suggests that further upsurges of struggle that we're going to see are going to have some participation of this kind of continuing anarchist um, presence and uh, political activity. Doug, is there anything I should do? I yes. thought the power thing was really bad. Okay, I'll try it. We're okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to shift then into talking um, <coughs> about interconnections. Because I think basically these political strands I've been talking about, and others as well, I don't want to pretend that this is the entirety of the important radical political work that's happening, but these are strands that I think are especially important for this current. And I think that they have been having increasing interconnection with one another and relationship, and that they're creating the basis for some kind of emerging new shared politics. And there's no consensus, I should be clear about this, there's no consensus on what to call these politics, right? Um, some people would call them abolitionist politics, some people would call them horizontalist, some people might call them autonomist, some people might just call them radical. And some people, predictably, would refuse political labels altogether. <laughs> and, and I've got respect for everybody every, in all those different places. Um, I prefer to use the term another politics, not because I'm trying to trademark a new term, but I think this is an interesting formulation that came in many ways out of a collective in New York called the Another Politics is Possible Collective, which brought a major delegation to the first U.S. social forum in 2007 in Atlanta. And of course, they were taking this up in a way that was pointing toward the Zapatista rebels in Chiapas, Mexico, and the kind of political vocabulary that they use, like their other campaign. And I think the term another politics is useful because it gestures kind of poetically toward something that is in process and unfinished. Something that consciously pushes beyond available political categories at the moment, and something that can be shared, that can be held in common. But for me, it's really a placeholder for something that we have yet to fully develop. I'm just kind of using it as this placeholder. It's funny to title a book with a placeholder, but that's, I was trying to talk about something that's in process rather than something that's a static, finished thing. So there's no party line within another politics. There's no central committee that determines how, you know, what these politics are. But I do think that there are some broad principles uh, that are shared across people in a wide variety of movement situations. And you were so good, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly talk about these four. These are just four general principles that I want to, and I'm going to be really brief on these. The first one is often associated with what's called the anti oppression politics. And it goes back into what I was talking earlier about radical women of color feminism this kind of integrated analysis idea. I think this is the no. This is the kind of against 
part of another politics and saying, this is what we don't want. And it means basically developing approaches and political analyses to challenge and transform these bigger social systems. And when I talk about these systems, I'm talking about heteropatriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, ableism, and other kinds of systems that structure how we are together and what our society looks like. And in concrete terms, this involves strategically trying to center the struggles of people who are most intensively impacted by these particular systems. And I think it also entails what a migrant justice organizer in Montreal, Sarita Puja, called reorganizing ourselves socially. So recognizing that these things don't just exist in the broader society, they also exist within our movements and our activist groups. And through struggle and political education, we have to work to change our own social relations inside. So that's, of course, also connected to the second principle, which is often something that people talk about in relation to a term called prefigurative politics. And prefigurative politics is a very fancy way to basically say, trying to manifest our values and our vision of the world to the best of our ability in how we organize and struggle right now. And I think this is the affirmative part of another politics, is the kind of thing that we're trying to construct uh, together. And it informs the types of organizations we build, the kinds of organizing methods we favor, and also the kinds of relationships we try to build with one another. It also frames, as a prison abolitionist in Toronto, Marika Warner, described to me, quote, the way that we interact, the way that we try to be aware of what is going on for people, and really try to make room for people to show up whole at the table. So it's also, I think, a commitment to try and make space for people to really enter movements with their whole selves and not have to leave parts of themselves at the door. The third principle is about strategy. And I think within another politics, there's a lot of people are really struggling with how to connect the kind of often short-term fights often defensive struggles, to longer-term radical visions. And the consistent question here is one that was posed to me by a housing and AIDS activist in New York, Michelle O'Brien. She asked, what's the connection between concrete activities and vision? What's the connection between concrete activities and vision? And I think that's a, that's a key question that we're still trying to figure out. But in general terms, I think one of the ways that people in the anti-authoritarian current try and work out this connection is by struggling in the world as it is, meaning sometimes fighting for very tangible improvements while also trying to hold on to a longer term radical vision in some way. And this also includes, this kind of vision based work includes building counter institutions, institutions that relate to people's deep needs, and there are lots of needs in the society, including housing, healthcare, food, play, all these things. So relating to people's needs while also connecting to larger movements, transforming the movements that are trying to change society. The last principle is about organizing, and I actually think it's one of the most important ones. Uh, one of the things that's been coming up so frequently on this tour is the way in which organizing and organizer have become very widespread the political identifications that have less and less content. So I'll be really clear on this point. Hosting a political opinion on Facebook is not organizing. <laughs> and this became very clear to me in conversation with a criminal justice reform organizer in New Orleans named Rosanna Cruz. When I asked Rosanna how she thinks about organizing, she gave me this awesome definition. She said, organizing is bringing people together in ways that link them up in a long-term struggle and build their power. I think this is great. Link people up, build their power in a longer-term struggle. And this involves developing relationships and working with people in the many places where we congregate. Workplaces, prisons, campuses, communities, so many different places, right? And coming together in ways to fight back, to try and challenge and transform dominant institutions and social relations. And at the same time, there are a lot of different kinds of organizing, of course. So within the anti-authoritarian current, people really favor less top-down kinds of organizing, more kinds of horizontal forms of organizing that involve things like trying to include everyone in deeply democratic methods of decision making, uh, trying to use forms of 
leadership and training development that develop people's capacities to really step up and take on more responsibilities and have more and more skills for moving forward together. And also participatory forms of political education, where people are actually building, widely building the kinds of analysis to understand society as it is. And we carry this out through a bunch of different organizational forms, including collectives linked to movements, democratic membership organizations, general assemblies, lots of different things. Okay, so there's a lot more to say about these, but I'm going to leave it at this. And, and the last thing I'll just mention is that these are often more aspirations than realities. I'm not, I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture with this either. I just want to say a lot of people are trying to move toward these kinds of principles and commitments, but it's not like anyone has them fully figured out. But that said, I do think through concrete organizing work, people are figuring out a lot of really useful lessons for how to do this. And I think some of these lessons are relevant not just for people within this political tendency, but for actually anybody who's interested in fundamental social transformation. So in the last part of this talk, I'm going to just briefly highlight three of the lessons that came up so consistently among people that I spoke with. It makes sense what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. Okay. There we go. And I use exclamation marks because I think they're really important. <laughs> uh, and because I'm just kind of dorky like that. So the first one is about how we treat one another, right? So one thing that we learn all too well in this society is how to relate with other people based on objectification, exclusion, contempt, rivalry, competition, and so on. Basically, in this society, we learn really well how to treat one another like shit. At their best, Movements create moments where people can, can actually experience other kinds of relational vision, other kinds of ways of relating that are based on better values, like generosity, respect, openness, collaboration, right? But, and I'm sad to say this, but often movements and our activist groups aren't that much better than the rest of society. And I don't think, sadly, that there's any way to make that change really instantaneously. I think these ways of treating one another like shit are deeply ingrained in how power works and how it's organized in society as it is currently structured. But even with understanding that, I think we should strive toward other ways of relating, toward better ways of relating. And part of how this became clear to me was in conversation with an um, uh, anti-prison organizer in Montreal named Helen Hudson. At one point, Helen said to me, struggle can be a really humanizing experience. And the way I understood what Helen was saying is to be this, that when we come together to collectively fight, we can experience our own humanity and the humanity of other people in really profound ways. So I believe that we can and should be building movements where we can manifest our best selves and where we can experience the best selves of other people. I think that's a crucial lesson for me my program. The second lesson is about experimentation. There is a tendency oftentimes in movements and in organizations of various kinds to find a tactic, an organizing approach, an organizational method, and then just repeat it. Find the thing that seems to work, and then just get identified with it, and use it over and over and over and over again. And that's a dead end, right? Like, we can get trapped in just repeating the same stuff, even when it's really ineffective, even when it's actually undercutting our efforts. I think we need to be more dynamic in how we think and act. And for this, it's useful to turn to a formulation that became somewhat more popular within the global justice movement, which was understanding movements as laboratories of resistance. I like this idea of laboratories of resistance. David Solnit uh, wrote about, David Solnit is a longtime direct action organizer in San Francisco, and he wrote about this concept of laboratories of resistance in 2005. And I want to just read a couple sentences of what he said. This is it. When we shift our thinking to see our organizing and actions as a laboratory, then we can see our actions as experiments. In keeping with the spirit, much of the value of the experiment is in the evaluation and discussion of what we learned. So, unfortunately, probably a lot of you encountered this in high school chemistry class. 
uh, and it's a sequence, right? It's basically like we try stuff out, maybe we succeed, maybe we fail, often we both succeed and fail in what we attempt to do, and then we try to learn from it, right? We try to evaluate what happened here, what can we do differently next time, how can we move forward, and this, I think, is an approach that can move us away from trying to hammer out perfect methods or perfect forms and be much more creative. Actually understand organizing as an ongoing learning process that we do together. Alright, so the last lesson is the most abstract thing I'm going to say uh, in the entire talk. Uh, and it's about linking up the against and beyond. And against and beyond are terms that I take from a radical theorist named John Holloway. The way I understand the against is our work to push against the existing system, to fight back, to protest it, to try and disrupt it, to shut it down in various ways. The beyond is our attempt to construct alternatives, to build the infrastructure of a different society in some way. In prison abolitionist terms, we can think about this as dismantling and building. And I think these are useful terms as well, dismantling and building. And the main thing I'm trying to say here is that we can do both these things together. There's a tendency for them to be very disconnected. And for people who are involved in oppositional work to see people who are involved in the building kind of work as fantastically utopians who are out to lunch. And for the people who are involved in the building work to try and construct alternatives to see the people who are involved in resistance activities as too negative and lacking any vision. But we need both. We need to be connected together. If we just do the against work without any beyond, we don't have any resilience. We don't have much vision, really. And our movements can be as full of fierce resistance as we can possibly make them. But if we don't have a kind of vision that we're building at the same time, then we're not going to actually get to a transformed society. We're just going to be perpetually fighting. And so I think we do have to build organizations and institutions that manifest that vision in some way. Now on the other hand, the beyond without the against is so easily co-opted, right? Like the interlocking systems that structure our society have an astounding capacity to accommodate and actually in many cases profit from rebellious subcultures and alternative communities. Punk rock is a perfect example of this, but there's, there are lots of other examples too. I'm for creating those kinds of alternatives, but I think they have to be linked to large-scale fights against power and profit-making as it's organized in the society. And basically what I'm getting at is just that I think we can consciously link together these two things. And I think that's how we built the basis for collective action that challenges the existing system and also builds a possibility for something else. All right, so just by way of conclusion, uh, I want to say that I think another politics really is happening across this continent and really across the globe as people are trying to figure out stuff. Mm -hmm. Learning lessons, grappling with challenges, some of which I've talked about, many of which I haven't. And uh, I'm excited about that. I, I think that that's useful. Um, but I also want to be really upfront that the stakes are really high right now on this planet. My understanding of the situation we're in is that the systems and institutions that dominate this world are undermining life and life making on a historically unprecedented scale. And we have our work cut out for us in fighting that. Uh, but I do continue to draw a lot of inspiration from the glimmers of possibility that shoot up whenever people come together and fight. And lately for me that's been looking at things in places like Hong Kong, and also in Ferguson. Um, and I'm hoping that we can understand our discussion today as part of that bigger conversation that I think is happening in a lot of other places. So that's what I have to offer. I'm going to remain seated um, as I was furiously taking notes. Um, it'll be easier for me to read them.
being here. Um, first, Chris, I just want to thank you for your talk. And that was great. And um, I think, you know, one of the things that I really have appreciated about knowing you over the years is, is the, you have a very kind of methodical but not overwrought you know, like thought process, which I think is really, really helpful. So I appreciate the linear thinking in that regard, but I think there's also a way that you have um, care with listening and distilling um, that makes it seem magical, but it's not magical, really, <laughs> at all. It's just very good practice. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is just talk about um, kind of four things that stuck out to me, and then a couple questions that got raised for me. Um, one of the things that I was, um, you know, noticing in kind of both discussing you know, the magic trick, but also discussing the historical context, is the value of organization. And I think um, that in a, a place like the Bay Area, for instance, but not exclusively, where lifestyle politics are really, you know, at a premium, um, especially in some of these historical strands that you pulled out, right, including the one that I do most of my work in. Um, I think really kind of reorienting toward organization and talking about the variety of formations that can take, right, whether that's a network or whether that's an organization or whether that's a coalition or et cetera, um, I think really is important to me in terms of thinking about the long term, right? So what is possible to build um, not only as kind of a collection of individuals, right, but when you put organizational form to work in terms of organizing a collection of individuals, what happens or what's possible. So that was one of the things that really struck me. Um, it's something I'd love to hear more people talk about. Um, second was, was, I was really excited that you raised uh, integrated analysis, because that is very close to my heart and very, um, so kind of integrated into my practice that I don't think about it, it's just kind of how stuff is, right? And I appreciate you kind of doing that history lesson with us because I think there's a way that intersectionality has become completely useless as a concept or as a frame. Um, and it's become very much like multiculturalism or some of the other things that I think don't do a whole lot of work or do the kind of work I'm less interested in at this point. Um, but I guess two things about that. So one is kind of recuperating it and reinvigorating um, it, right? Giving it a little bit of its teeth back. Um, but also, you know, drawing out that it requires revolutionary politics, right? To have integrated, you know, uh, to do integrated analysis requires revolutionary politics. And I appreciate that. And one of the examples that I think um, I just want to elevate uh, is this uh, document that got produced at the very beginning, um, Inside Women of Color Against Violence and Critical Resistance, um, a very, very similar history and very similar evolutions, right? So both organizations were developed out of conferences, um, 1998 conference there um, for critical resistance, <laughs> and um, in Santa Cruz, right, for First Color of Violence, um, which is how Inside developed and around the same time. 2000. Yeah, so so we were 98 and we were 2000, right? And a lot of the same players, mm -hmm. right? Involved in both of those. And so in 2001, 2001, after um, Insight had decided to make itself an organization as well, uh, the two organizations collaborated on a statement um, that's got some totally boring title like the Critical Resistance Inside Statement Against Gender Violence in the Prison Industrial Complex or something. I can never remember exactly what the title is. We normally call it the CR Inside Statement, or if you're at Insight, probably the Inside CR Statement. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> one of the reasons I raise it there in terms of an integrated analysis is that I think one of the things that we were very cognizant of, both of our organizations kind of from the jump, was the idea that um, uh, the strands of our work tended to be pitched as counter to each other, right? And so we want to take that head on, right? The idea that people who were fighting for the abolition of the prison industrial complex would necessarily not take into account the people who were most harmed by the most violent 
um, instances, whether that was at the hands of state violence or at the hands of interpersonal violence. And so we say at the beginning, in part because um, of these shared politics and these same players, let's address that. Let's say we want to develop a prison industrial complex abolitionist politics that integrates and understands and says out, out in front, right, that we also reject state violence, interpersonal violence, and we don't think that engaging the state as a remedy for harm, interpersonal or state harm, is, is adequate or um, helps us meet our needs. So that, I'm just thinking about kind of the ways in which these small things, and you know, Insight did a really good job of using that document as an organizing tool, and they still use it. And, um, and uh, we put a book out for our 10th anniversary called Abolition Now, and one of the pieces in that book is by um, Andrea Ritchie and Elisa Beria, who uh, talked about the kind of 10 years of using that statement and the organizing work that it did. So I appreciated that. Um, then in terms of uh, all of the kind of transformational aspects of what you talked about, um, all kinds of things came to mind, right? So you discussed developing new social relations as one of the things that emerged in talking to people. Um, and you talked about struggle, right? Um, and building counter institutions, right? And all of those kind of being aspirational, and that is certainly true of my experience, <laughs> <laughs> that we have big dreams, and sometimes the working out of those big dreams is not everything that we hoped it would be. But I hoped, um, actually, just to say a couple things about that. So one is that um, in all of those cases, one of the uh, challenges and cautions, I guess, that's always on my mind is that, yes, we are trying to build um, counter institutions, transform relationships with each other and, and our environments, whether those are social or physical, right? Um, and we want to do that without developing a, such a shadow state, right? A so what? a shadow state. Or a shadow state. So one of the things that comes up a lot for um, in my work against the prison industrial complex is this kind of gold standard question of like, what are you going to do instead, right? And, then, and we're situated often in such a way to understand ourselves as having to replace things in kind of a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So if you say you want to let people out of jail, what are you going to have instead of jail? And it's not like, how are we going to transform our social relationships such that jail is not on our, on our radar as a thing to have, right? But what are you going to build? You know, really, I think in some people's cases, like literally, what building are you going to build instead of the jail, right? And so I think that um, I worry sometimes that that's not kind of at the forefront enough of our minds when we're talking about alternative institutions or transforming our social relationships. Um, and I want to just raise that up because I think that that's actually a really interesting thing. And one of the um, key things that was missing from the dismantling build is the thing that CR says is just dismantle change building, mm -hmm. right? So the change for us is actually really, really key because it's not, you know, dismantle and build again, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, inside of all of that, I guess, is struggle and a dialectical approach to this kind of engagement, right? Um, and you know, one of the things that I was thinking about is the, you know, the kind of core politics are aspirational, but they are also guides, right? So I made myself a note here that they're like bumpers and bowling, right? So, you know, you have these things that like, you know, they're like the organizer training wheels, right? <laughs> so that you have um, a path and the ball's going all over the place, right? You might not still hit any pins but um, enough of a container and a strong enough container to let ideas zigzag around in and to improvise and to innovate and to experiment. Because I really do think um, that the politics, if they are durable but flexible, right, allow us to experiment and allow us to take risks. And so one of the organizations that I'm um, really grateful to be affiliated with is an organization called Creative Interventions. 
that is a very long story about creative interventions that we could talk about another time. But um, you know, one of our kind of core principles, it's an organization that was developed to test out um, approaches to interpersonal harm that did not rely on policing or similar state sanctioned interventions. Um, and you know, one of the kind of core principles or core values of that organization was risk taking. And um, this is a big deal in the anti-violence world, that an organization that was addressing interpersonal harm, um, violence particularly against women of color, uh, gender queer and gender non-conforming people, um, and migrant communities would have risk taking as one of its core things. But we really did think that if we are using an organizing approach to doing this, which was our practice, that there has to be struggle, and that struggle is not always um, negative, right? That there is productive struggle, right? Which I guess comes back to this sense of dialectics that I was talking about before. That there's some productive tension, there's some productive struggle. Um, and that it requires leaps, right? We are required to take leaps sometimes to um, advance our thinking or advance our practice. And, um, and I think the experimentation is really, really, really key. I mean, the organization that I'm part of, I just described as an experiment, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think I told you this, that we didn't plan to live. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. really good. Right? So we were an organization that was like, okay, let's try this, right? And, you know, when we started formally to, to call ourselves an organization in 2001, um, we sat in rooms not like, unlike this with close allies who told us that we were doing a disservice to the movement by talking about abolition because it was pure utilitarianism, right? And this is just 2001, right? And I, I feel like, I'm sure this was never true, but I feel like there was a time when I could like name every abolitionist, like a loud abolitionist in the country, right? Um, and now I'm surrounded by people that whether or not they actually practice those politics, that's the last kind of weird thing to talk about um, in, in shared rooms. And so um, I think you know, it's been an experiment. It's been an experiment in terms of its form. It's been an experiment in terms of its politics. And that's served us well in some cases and really, really poorly <laughs> in others. Um, and then I think the idea of, of struggle and risk taking also opens up some other questions for me around um, safe spaces, whole selves, you know, those kinds of issues too. And I actually want to challenge the idea that people should be able to bring out whole selves everywhere they go. Um, there are some people who I think should not bring their whole selves everywhere they go. And I just do believe that, right? And I think that there's um, an aspect of entitlement around I get to be safe, I get to feel comfortable. Um, and that's not to say I want people to be living in terror and be completely, you know. Um, on their heels all the time, but I think when we're not on our heels once in a while, right, we don't develop our capacity to bounce back, we don't develop that, those muscles that help us stay in that, you know, leaning back position, and, you know, I think the kind of interplay that's necessary in productive struggle again, right, so I'm not just talking about fighting, I'm talking about productive struggle, um, you know, advances again, advances, um, I think, in our practice and, and really helps us sharpen our analysis and, an application of that analysis. And I wonder, also, um, given that, you know, I don't know that you said necessarily that there were anti-capitalist politics embedded in anti-authoritarianism, but I think lots of people would say they are, they are also anti-capitalist. And I wonder about that, right? If you believe you are entitled to bring your whole self to have a safe space, et cetera, et cetera, kind of what that brings with that in terms of those politics. So I didn't work that out while you were talking. <laughs> so there's no answer there. <laughs> um, the, the last kind of thing that got raised for me, um, you were talking about the harm-free zone, and that's a project that we worked on, our, our New York chapter worked um, a lot on. And um, it raised for me the concept of productive failure, um, which is something that I talk a lot about inside of our organization. It's like, that was an epic fail in some ways, I think. Um, but a very, very important thing to have tried and in a very important period. Um, and so, you know, I, I appreciate that in part because I think we've seen the evolution. We didn't give up 
on that concept. They're like, that's a really good concept. We didn't do that well mm -hmm. there. But this is actually, this has some legs. Let's figure out how to make it go. And that has evolved over a, a long period of time and has developed things like creative interventions, mm -hmm. right? So Mimi Kim, who started Creative Interventions, is also one of the people who worked with us on the Heart of Food Zones in New York. Um, but it also has meant that we tried a similar thing in New Orleans before Katrina. It's meant that we tried a similar thing in uh, Durham, North Carolina. And these days, our Oakland chapter is developing um, a thing that they're calling the Open Power Project, which is completely an evolution of this same thing, which is the idea of seeding projects, uh, local projects that get elevated by lots of conversation with neighbors over a long period of time but aren't anti-policing projects necessarily. Our projects about like, I would only call the cops if I had an emergency because I don't know how to deal with a health emergency, right? Or I call the ambulance and the cops came first, right? So the first thing they're working on are these health-based projects. And they're small scale. They're maybe like, they're still figuring out what they're gonna do first, but they're maybe like medical kits that people in the neighborhood can have that have quick clot or have bandages or have a pamphlet on like how to know somebody's really in diabetic distress or if it's something that you can do, right? Um, so that they don't have to call the cops, right? So it's it's not a no campaign in the way that you were describing, but it is an erosion of the power of the cops to have anything to do, any like legitimate role in your day-to-day -day life, right? Um, and so I think that like really embracing failure kind of moving forward from it can be great. And then two questions came up for me. One was the concept of self-defense. It was interesting to me that in your remarks, the concept of self-defense didn't come up until no one was leaving, mm -hmm. right? For me, talking about you know uh, anti-racist feminism, self-defense is right there. Talking about the roots of prison industrial complex, abolition, prison abolitionism, Self-defense is key, right? So I think for us, our politics is way more about self-defense and self-determination than it is about eliminating prisons, for instance. Okay? Um, and so I, I wonder if there is something else there around self-defense. And I know that that's a somewhat antiquated term for some organizers at this point, um, but I think it's key and I want to just acknowledge it's probably on my mind because... What do you mean by that, self-defense? I mean, I know a start, but are you saying that you can use violence if someone's doing something bad to you? Is that I guess I'm talking about in the broadest sense possible. So I think if, for instance, somebody um, thinks that engaging in armed struggle if somebody's shooting at them is the thing to do, they're all the way to um, the ability to uh, not have to leave your house if your partner's abusing you. Right, and kind of everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's the and, connection between that and prison abolitionism? Well, I mean, I think for, for us, um, and I don't know, I can't speak to prison abolitionism broadly, I can tell you what critical resistance mm -hmm. thinks about PIC abolition. Um, I think for us, it is really in, intimately tied to self determination, right? Mm -hmm. And so the capacity to um, increase autonomy, right? but also, I think, has a legacy that comes out of armed struggle. Um, but, you know, while that's not being practiced by our, our people today, I think has much more to do with um, non-capitulation, non-compliance with the cops, mm -hmm. guards, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and like I was saying, I just want to acknowledge it. I think Dylan Rodriguez, every time I see him, I just saw him last weekend, reminds me about self-defense. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that's probably on my mind in some ways because of that. And then the other one is, is a somewhat antiquated term too, but I think is really important to my organization, which is third world liberationism, um, and those historical legacies, and internationalism. Um, and so I think you talked about kind of you know, anti-globalization and some of that stuff that happens that way, but also I think an ethic of internationalism um, has been really, really crucial to our development and has shaped um, Again, what we mean by self termination and self defense as well. So, those are my thoughts. Awesome. Um, Do you guys want to open up the people who engage with you?
Would you want to respond first? Well, certainly I have lots of ideas that came up in response to what Rachel had to say, but I can I can certainly work some of that in also into into hearing from other people too. So I'm some time to you to, to Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And if asking a question you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm Dan. Uh, more introduction? Like, yeah, sure. This is how, how much introduction do we want? Just as, as much as you want to give. Okay, I'm Dan. Um, so I had I, I was interested in talking a little bit more about intersectionality as a frame and its potential value or as I think Rachel. Uh, I think you suggested that maybe it's not lost in that <laughs> value, and maybe I would assume that maybe you think it's lost value because it's become more of a rhetorical term, but do, do you have a response to that at all? Like, I, I'm interested in what its potential value is beyond, say, my recognizing that there are topics that are fundamentally related to, say, women of color feminism. <laughs> like, I can say, women of, fem women of color feminism um, has this set of relationships to, say, prison abolition, and then I sort of don't want to do certain things that might, you know, be set down with people's toes or, you know, counterproductive or something like that. But looking beyond that, do you see value for intersectionality? Yeah, I mean, I think you answered your own question in relationship to me, which is that uh -huh. yeah, I think it has become more and more rhetorical. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, Roxanne Denver Ortiz and I actually have gone round and round about this. And she's like a very, very critical of the term intersectionality. And at first, that kind of threw me. Like, her criticisms really threw me. And then I started to understand a little bit more where she was coming from. And I think part of it for her was she felt like there wasn't enough anti capitalist analysis in intersectionality. They're like, they, and it was actually treating class relations in this very reduced form um, and not actually talking about intersections in like a rigorous way. Um, and and I've definitely experienced some of that too, as intersectionality has often been taken up within academic context. And that's part of the reason why I really wanted to go back to that integrated analysis, where they talk explicitly about all of these social systems and connected, as you pointed out, to revolutionary politics, right? It's not about kind of trying to have um, more ground places in higher places, right? That is actually about trying to transform the whole society and the relations that structure that society. Uh, so. But at the same time, I have to say, like, like even on this speaking tour, as I'm talking with a lot of undergraduate student activists, a lot of people get radicalized through coming into contact with um, ideas around intersectionality in university spaces. And I want to be like upfront and real and respectful of that to you. Um, so I'm kind of careful not to like be totally dismissive of the ways that people are using that term because I actually think it's being used in. A bunch of different ways with a whole variety of meetings. Um, and I'm interested in just trying to be more specific about it. You both. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. I'm Barbara Epstein. Um, I taught at UC Santa Cruz, Chris mentioned me. Um, one of the things that worries me about the uh, contemporary form of radicalism is uh, the either resistance or lack of attention to building organizations that can last and building institutions that can last. And I think one of the reasons people resist that is because there is a certain amount of um, uh, hierarchy or bureaucracy or you know at least at, at least lack of fluidity that is likely to be part of that but on the other hand if we don't have those institutions things fall apart um, and so do you think there's space for doing that kind of thing you know do you where do you think that fits in the um, uh, the anti-authoritarian approach and if I could throw in another question at the same time, it seems to me that one of the dangers of the, um, the, the current kind of politics is the danger of its uh, uh, becoming a counterculture that is attractive only to people who are either already part of the, that counterculture or very close to it. And 
uh, that raises the question of how you genuinely build a grassroots movement that includes people who are not part of that and don't want to be part of that. Mm -hmm. The counterculture. The counter yeah, right. Right. Somehow in the 60s, it was possible to do both at once. You know, there was a strong countercultural element, and yet there was also this wide periphery that people felt comfortable joining. And I don't know how you uh, consciously create that. Um, yes, I think there is space for building organizations and institutions. I think it's absolutely critical to talk about organization and institution building. Um, I do think that there are a lot of tendencies within anarchist politics in particular that are debilitating for building long-lasting organizations and institutions, like a commitment to certain kinds of uh, spontaneous action or suspicion of anything that resembles leadership, although leadership's always happening no matter what, whether we talk about it or not, um, and any kind of like long-lasting structure. Um, and also, the question of representation is really, is really rough. Yeah. Like, having people that are in some way designated to represent yeah. groups, and which is something that you have to wrestle with when you're talking about any form of large-scale, long-lasting organization. Um, so I think there are real challenges, but I'm definitely heartened by how many people I've been encountering who are actually in the process of building organizations, um, and at least talk about wanting institutions. Um, although I think we're really lacking in left institutions at the moment. Like, it's almost like I feel sometimes like I can count them on my two hands yeah. in the U.S. Um, and that's really, I mean, it makes me, it makes me like long for like really antiquated kinds of left institutions, you know? Like, I, I, and maybe this is ridiculous, but like lately I've even been like, I really long for like dues paying membership organizations. You know, they have like their own independent financial basis because people are paying on a sliding scale on a regular basis and then there's some money there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and of course there are examples of people starting to do that, like in Halifax, Halifax, Solidarity Halifax is a membership dues paying organization that's tried to build a pluralistic, anti-capitalist group with um, multiple generations working on campaigns together and it's in a small city, it's, it's interesting. So anyways, yes, I do think there's space, but I think it's rough. I think there's Neoliberalism has been a real challenge, um, and the decimation of some of the better organizations coming out of the liberation movements of the 60s by state intervention has been really rough. Um, so, yeah, it's a challenge. Uh, and then on the danger of the counterculture, I just have to completely agree with you. Like, that's and I, it's something that I have kept trying to talk about and certainly tried to foreground in writing the book is this constant challenge of subcultural insularity that happens over and over again. And there's so many dynamics that play into that that I think are really debilitating and are related to the fact that we've been living in a period of defeat for four decades, where some many people, I think, feel like the best we can do is have kind of perfect insulated activist scenes that aren't really winning on a big scale or trying to appeal to any, anyone. Stuff that you all have written much about. But Rachel, do you want to say something about any of that stuff? No, that was like the stuff I was going to do. Oh, okay. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> You've been trying to jump sure. through a lot. <laughs> um, I'm Daniel. I'm a grad student at Stanford. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of this stuff. And I'm really excited about this book and its work. I have some great comments and, and extensions and questions as well. So thanks a lot for both of you. Um, uh, I guess just one quick reflection on the last conversation about institution. Um, it seems like a, an important tension that emerges is this, like, the the importance on like, how we treat one another matters and the sort of relationship and community building work as opposed to institutions, which are, like, by definition, impersonal, you know, impersonal structures that anybody can come in. So negotiating that and how do you prioritize those and how do those interact with one another would be is a, an important challenge to keep wrestling with. Um, but on that, and, and the lessons that you presented at the end, you said lessons for movement building. Um, I guess my question is, like, is there some sort of metric on how, you say how we treat one another matters, and I say, okay, yeah, generally speaking, that's, that's true. Um, matters for what? Because our movements are going to be bigger 
and more effective and more powerful if we treat each other in certain ways, or because people are going to feel better in them, um, people are going to stay in them as long. So it seems to me if it's a question, if it's a lesson for movement building, it's a question about scale. You know, we're talking about scale and power. And the top priority is how we treat one another matters. I wonder, you know, is that, you know, does that set limitations on how big and powerful it can be if we're prioritizing that as a, a top a top priority? Is that as important in terms of building a movement broadly? Um, and then with the other things as well, I mean, we're talking about experimental approach. Is that how we're defining its value for movement building? And it's really hard to evaluate, you know, the, the causality between I was in this meeting that was really democratic and consensus based, and now I'm radicalized. You know, like showing that causality is really has been really difficult in research. But I wonder what your thoughts are. How do we go on that? Um, I love it. These are like big, big rough questions. Do you want to say anything first on that? Well, I'll say something. I think. Um, I mean, I think that's, that is the question, right? I think for an organization like mine. Um, and it's, you know, I mean, one of the things that's, uh, I'm going to how to articulate this. I'm one of the last founders in the day-to-day -day life of my organization, right? Um, and I, I, I guess I'm the last founder in the day-to-day -day life of my organization. There's some other founders that are around in different ways. Um, and so I think I have a different sense of the container than other people who entered a pre-existing thing, right? Um, and for me, um, how we treat people matters, I think, is kind of a ethic. That, you know, um, that hopefully informs, you know, that is kind of embedded in um, trying to build something that is um, not punitive and something that is not, you know, rooted entirely in, in kind of coercion, right? Um, and I think it poses incredibly difficult logistical challenges, right? Um, because I think, um, you know, we've had cycles of people come through very much, I think, Barbara, in the way that you were suggesting, like, countercultural attraction, right? So we had for a while a bunch of people coming through, and they just, we're very old time, right? I mean, we run in a, in a way that requires lots of discipline. People got to show up to me and do things, and, you know, I mean, we're old. It's funny to say that we're old time in that way, that, like, we're not, like, yeah, I don't know. We're not an affinity group, and we're not a network, and we're not, you know, like, you got to come to me. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, there is, I think, a, this, um, that, it, that does prevail, I think, in some ways. It has been integrated into how people get attracted to doing certain kinds of work. Um, and I think, the, in, in some ways, work that is perceived as being very radical, um, that's at a, a higher premium. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. um, but then when, you know, you encounter leadership or you encounter power, and I would say power is always circulating mm -hmm. too, right? And I think there is a distinction between coercive power and uh, non-coercive power. Um, then, you know, sometimes there's like, oh, I don't feel good, right? And that's, I think, some of the stuff I was getting, I was like, I don't need you to feel good all the time. I don't think you get to feel good all the time, right? Um, and I think sometimes that gets, uh, the reaction to that is like, well, we're not treating each other in line with our politics. So if I hold you accountable, right? Or I, you know, as our members say, call you in, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then call you out. The fact that you can't even say call out, for instance, I think is interesting in that regard, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, th those kinds of things, um, I, I think it poses really like logistical challenges. And I don't think it's counter to the politics, you know, to hold each other accountable or to have somebody who coordinates things be like, hey, you said you're going to do this thing, right? Um, and I think there are challenges given some of the critiques, and I didn't get into this thing, but part of the issue I have with um, the ways in which the nonprofit industrial complex has been spun out eight bajillion times, right, um, is that I think there's this way that, like, 
if the IRS knows you exist, you're corrupt, right? So we, you know, or if you have anybody paying in your organization, you're, you know, you're counter to what your politics are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then they get posted a chance to build in long-term, lasting organizations and institutions, but also to make a change, to do things together in, in the long term. And so I think it, it's a very circuitous way, sorry. Was like thinking about it and like talking about that, um, but it, I think that there's yeah, it's an ethic. And I think it's a it's a a principle, right? That we need to transform our social relationships if we're going to make the shifts of power that we want to make. And logistically, I think it poses real challenges. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you have a number of hands to choose from. <laughs> Yes, hey, um, Chris, you had mentioned earlier, and I'd like to really know what really happened behind, because it seemed like it was a really critical mass situation of the Wall, Occupy Wall Street movement, mm -hmm. and what happened behind, like, when it was over, it just seemed like it was over. Mm -hmm. There, yeah, there were splinter groups that occur, uh, spun out of that, and a number of key, kind of semi-high profile individuals. But other than that, it seemed like, the young people, they really understood it, they got it, and they did a movement, but then after that, it just seemed like steam went out, fizzled out. Mm -hmm. What were the forces that, because there had to be some forces to help dismantle that. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know which ones and how. <laughs> well, Jean Kwan's talking this afternoon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but my counting lady in Berkeley only goes to that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that's an excellent question about Occupy, and I'd actually be curious to hear from anybody here, because I imagine other folks here have their own Occupy experiences, and that, that's part of what's challenging about Occupy, too, is that there were so many particular local experiences of how it fizzled out in various ways. I mean, I do think it's possible to draw some generalizations, um, which don't hold true for everywhere, but are happen in many places. Like, as I've gone around and talked with people who were involved in various occupies, many of them tell similar stories of um, really struggling to maintain the capacity to meet all the needs of the people who were starting to show up at encampments, particularly houseless populations, and then having real big internal fights about whether they should even be trying to provide some of that. Um, and that burned out a lot of people, for sure, those kinds of fights. Now, of course, there was all kinds of stuff happening in almost every city coming from um, city governments mm -hmm. and police that were trying in various ways, trying to enforce municipal regulations or using more, I mean, as in Oakland, right, sometimes much more intensive kinds of force to try and get people out of those camps. So there was, a, there was definitely sort of a push, a constant push factor from many city governments. And in, in many cases, I think in some cases, they had concerted political strategy to try and displace the encampments. Um, and, we, and now there were some revelations, for example, about some of these city governments coordinating through conference calls and stuff. But I think in many other cases, especially smaller cities and, and more rural areas, where there were many encampments, but no one ever talks about it, it was more just city authorities getting so caught up in their own regulations of public space and getting freaked out about concentrations of people living in poverty taking over public space that they start to enforce these kinds of regulations. But it's also true that, like, it was incredibly difficult to sustain on the ground for people who were actually out there 24 seven. Like, I think that there was a certain kind of um, uh, excitement and enthusiasm that so many people experienced about being present in a constant kind of way in an encampment and almost the development of a certain kind of like uh, developing counterculture there. Um, but it was also just tremendously exhausting for so many people and a lot of the um, organizational forms that people were using were not terribly adequate for making longer term decisions about what people were going to do. But so much of the identity of the Occupy movement was tied up in those encampments. Mm -hmm. And so when, through a variety of factors, they fell apart, they got pushed out, whatever happened, I think a lot of people were quite confused about what to do next when we didn't have that kind of ready-made way of congregating and talking and engaging in action. That said, there certainly have been a number of spin-offs. I think some of the more interesting ones have been related to 
um, fights against foreclosure and housing evictions, right? Like Occupy Our Homes stuff um, in places like Twin Cities and other places. Atlanta, they've still been winning victories in Atlanta around that. Um, but it's so much more dispersed. I think you're right that it kind of, it was like there and then it fizzled. But one of the things I keep encountering, especially on the speaking tour, is all the people who were involved in Occupy who are in this moment now of kind of uncertainty and demoralization and saying, I gained a lot of political analysis. I developed skills through this experience. What am I going to do now? What should we be doing? Where's the movement? Um, and so I think a big question for all of us is, well, what can we build to help kind of sustain some of that energy uh, and those people who are still, still out there? Hmm. Uh, Jonathan, I um, am downstairs on the floor and um, was, in, was at Occupy New York for um, uh, about a year, even though he came with us two months, um, and then Occupy Homes. Um, so I have a question, but it really relates to your question, too. So I, like, um, I, I think one of the problems that we had in Occupy, which is um, connected to a problem in the left, given that we're kind of at the tail end of, hopefully the tail end of a 40 year period of decline, um, has been this kind of, um, you know, navel gazing and, um, there's reasons for it. Uh, and in Occupy, it was the confusion of our tactic and the space for the role we were playing in relationship to society to, to name a crisis and to be a vehicle for change for that crisis. And there's this constant tension between becoming this kind of insular counterculture and acting as that vehicle. And there was a lot of ambivalent, I think, because the, the, the kind of social DNA of the, of the movement toward being that vehicle. And, um, you know, one quite the, the so you said, um, Chris, you said movements aren't that much better than the society. And, um, Part of me wonders, you know, I, I'm always for improving the culture and the norms in, inside movements, but part of me wonders whether the point is for movements to be um, better than society. And if there's a, I think there is a danger in people looking at movements as this kind of um, uh, sacred space to the detriment of, you know, to, to and, and I think you see this in the social movement literature over the past four years where we start looking at social movements as a trip to the zoo where we, you know, look at the eccentric features of this kind of neatly bounded thing instead of uh, movements as indicators of crisis in society and vehicles for addressing that. Um, so one last thing on this, even the way we use, um, the way I'm inclined to, and I heard both of you use the term politics, there's this question of, are we talking about a set of principles and beliefs or are we talking about something that relates to the train of power, you know, not that it has to be either one, but this this question is I think often we throw around our politics as if it's just about our opinions and are losing sight of this. Um, so I guess my question is where does where do contests of power come into this? Because I heard it in point number three that you were saying, Chris, I heard it in a number of points that you, that you were making, that there there is this layer of contest, but my fear you know, and I was involved in a lot of them, the same, we, we paralleled uh, in anti-authoritarian movements, but my, you know, own process in them is, is wondering, uh, you know, are we looking away from that question of contestation because it feels coercive and manipulative when it should be a, a, a central part of, of what we're talking about and struggling for. Sorry, that was a lot to have one. Okay, so I'll be really uh, straightforward with this. Um, I am really moved by a slogan from the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty, which is fight to win. Um, and that's one of the things I've been doing on a speaking tour is strategy workshops where I really try and push that, that I think we should fight to win. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and for me, winning does ultimately mean a contest of power. Like, I don't think that we can win just by creating nice alternatives. And that's part of the reason why I try to be so clear about linking both the kind of construction and constructive part, but also the oppositional part. Because I do, I mean, I had this fascinating conversation last week with an NPR reporter 
who was interviewing me for a radio program in Eugene, and she said, so how do you think change happens? Great question to have to answer on APR. <laughs> um, and I said, well, ultimately, I think change happens when we get enough people together and we build enough disruptive power that we can actually fight back against the, the dominant institutions in our society. Um, and that we are going to have to figure out how we're going to take that space then, right, to build what we want. And I love what you said about being careful about not the one one to one replacement. I think that's really key, right? About not saying we're just going to replace each existing institution with our own like hippy dippy alternative, <laughs> but then we're talking about an actual social transformation. That's such a key point. Um, so I do think contests for power are crucial, but I think it's hard to talk about that, and I think. That's partly related to this period of defeat that we've been moving through, where I see such a profound lack of ambition on the left. Um, and I, I think we should be ambitious, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's also related to the turning inward. So I, I relate, definitely, Jonathan, I relate to some of what you say about that and a tendency to turning inward. Um, I do also want to defend treating each other well. Uh, and, and I put it forward as a challenge with a recognition that it's also contradictory, right? Mm -hmm. Like the question of scale certainly comes up. But I think there's been this tendency on the left to have to choose, to say, we either treat people well or we win, right? We either, either treat people like instruments and we win, or we don't, we treat people in more humane ways, and then we just kind of hang out in our intentional communities. And what I'm saying is, I don't want to choose. I refuse to make that choice. I, th I want to do both at the same time. And, and I want to jump into the contradictions that that opens up for the organizations that we're building. Um, I don't want to evade those contradictions at all. Can I add just one thing to that, which is, I know that in the kind of small part of the movement that I'm a part of, um, there, the leadership of our movement all got killed or locked up for direct contestations to power. And so I think um, that legacy is very much alive because the people who are still alive <laughs> are in cages, for the most part. Um, or really struggle, you know, psychologically and socially, um, not across the board, but in many, in many cases. And so I, I, take you, I take your question seriously, and I think I've seen um, in, in our little sector um, that the kind of Decimation, I don't actually think that that's too strong a word, um, of particularly um, the black power movement um, in the very intentional decimation of the black power movement um, still has less lasting uh, trickles. And I think there are, you know, uh, you know, so part of the founding of our organization and the founding members of our organization um, come out of those struggles and you know, some of them have been like, you need to be thoughtful about the moves that you make and, you know, particularly when people want to talk about self-defense, etc. So I think there are really, you know, still a lot of kind of repercussions from that that have to get negotiated um, and, and I think have complicated what people um, imagine is possible in terms of kind of direct confrontation, but also the risk they're willing to we have about five minutes left until we promise to leave the room. So probably, could we take both questions at the same time and then maybe get a response? Well, not exactly at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Manny, you and I uh, edited a couple of books on globalization movements. Thanks to both of you. Um, so one was sort of uh, quick on, on the Occupy. Uh, in Oakland and many other places, there were actually conflicts amongst and between anti-authoritarians. Right, so I think that may be worth reflecting on. Going back to treating people well, what happens when you disagree and there was you know, very substantive conflicts, which ended up having a big impact on precisely those non-activist communities who now have a very bad idea, unfortunately, about anti-authoritarians and whatever. And another question, just more broad, maybe it's in the book, is um, the relationship you know, between the rise of anti-authoritarian politics and kind of political economy, you know, post-Bordism, neoliberalism, because it seems to be that it's, I, I'm not an authoritarian myself, but the issue of climate change has really challenged me to think about the state or large scale power. And how do we deal with this? I mean, there's, there's enough time has passed, there's some very cogent critiques of localism, and a lot of anti authoritarian politics tends to veer into like localist orientations and, you know, very much 
we're going to, you know, dual chiropractic stress, but often kind of radical social work, which may or may not, you know, when you start talking about the kinds of scale of crisis that we're talking about, I think the Latin American movements are challenging us to find it. So that's. Um, would you like to share? Yeah, I, I wanted to say something about the question of treating people badly within the movement, and at least one area that I can think of where I think it's really disruptive to the movements, um, but I also don't know what to do about it, uh, which is, in my experience, it's often difficult to, especially at moments when the movement is at a kind of peak of intensity, to bring up dissident ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for instance, if you're in a movement that has become passionately attached to particular tactics um, and you put your hand up and you say, you know, I don't think it's working. I think maybe we have to think about something different. Um, it's not so much that you get treated badly by one person. It's not an individual matter. It's more that it's in the air. There are things you're not supposed to say, and if you do say them, you're likely to be ostracized, people are going to talk about your bad politics, and so forth. And I could name lots of situations in which people become silenced and drift out of the movement because they feel that they're not able to say what they think. Um, now, the reason I say I don't know what to do about it is I've seen it so often, uh, and also because I think that there's something about that kind of peak of intensity in a movement that uh, is, uh, there's a kind of solidarity that gets built around sharing opinions. Mm -hmm. And when somebody differs from that opinion, it's just, it, it, you know, the, share, the, the intense solidarity around particular opinions comes to be part of what defines the movement. So I don't know what to do about it, but I think it's a serious problem. Did you both have things to say? Do you want to quickly jump in? Um, what do I want to say? There's so many things, but I, I, I think the first thing for me, I, I hear a lot about developing the theory and this and that. I think that's just a huge mistake. It, it, it's something good for maybe some academics and such to do, but I think the ideology and being strict and saying this relates to this in this way, I think it's a dead end. Um, and I don't think there's ever any end theory or I think we're always developing stuff. So I don't, you know, uh, I think you said nothing is full, uh, so no politics is fully developed ever, I think. And it's a mistake to think that at any point we have a lot of the answers. Um, that said, so I was saying to Barbara earlier, I'm now 57, I was active in every kind of movement from, you know, anti-war, Vietnam War, anti-nuclear, the Clamshell Alliance, Seabrook, uh, started the anti-apartheid organizing on this campus in the 80s. I've been a journalist overseas now in a lot of liberation movements, guerrilla struggles. Um, um, I think we have to accept a certain level of imperfection about everything. And one of the great dangers of the left is thinking that this theory that these geniuses have, you know, come up with much smarter than any of us probably, you know, um, maybe, you know, maybe exception to probably some of these people, but, um, you know, is thinking that's going to be close to the kind of world that we can create. Um, and that those are the things to focus on. You know, you talk about dialectics. Every time I hear that now, I think that's just such a mistake to even mention the word. It, to me, it's so mechanical and simplistic that, that there's a thousand things going on. And if we focus too tightly on these few contradictions of this, that we're going to end up trying to impose this on analyzing the world. That said, I've been part of lots of movements, and I, and, and I don't know how to deal with that tension between the complexity that I think never allows us to predict what's going to happen historically. As I said to Barbara, sitting in 1901, you could have never imagined what happened in the 20th century in your wildest. And keeping that and then keeping this, this, this the passion, the emotion, the empathy with the oppressed, the desire to change the world, to make it less hypocritical, 
I'm now wrestling with those two things and how do you have a movement that somehow um, realizes it doesn't have the answers but is self-righteous enough to make sacrifices. So I think of myself now, the art of an organizer when you're young is you are going to be self-righteous, but how to appear that you're not. And when you're old, you're not going to be self-righteous, but how to appear in a way that you are. So let's hope those coming after us are on Berkeley time. It would be great if we feel like we can have five to respond to us. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all. Uh, I'll, yeah, I'll, just to that, I would say, yep, it's, I think it's really a challenge to not uh, confuse our um, concepts for understanding social reality with social reality. Um, and that's definitely a tendency to happen in political spaces, to like think that the words that we use to describe what's happening are actually what's happening. That's, what's happening is always going to exceed our ability to fully put words on. Um, so I appreciate that. Uh, and definitely hear you on dissident opinions and, and the challenge of the new space for those. I don't have a straightforward answer. Um, and climate change, I agree with you. Like, I think it opens up really big questions for what kind of strategy for social transformation we need and what kind of wins we want to try and make um, in the near term, right? Because we're, at this point, I think we're living in climate catastrophe. We can talk. We can talk. Yeah. Yeah, I think what people said, you know, it's definitely that. I want to thank both Chris and Rachel for an amazing discussion.